Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free. With two and a half months till the Beijing Winter Olympics, a missing Chinese athlete is gaining international attention. The United Nations is backing her, and the Women's Tennis Association is considering whether to pull out of China. Some say Beijing is suffering by its own making. Here's more. The UN Office for Human Rights requested information over the whereabouts of Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai on Friday. UN human rights spokesperson Liz Thorsell. We would stress that, that it's important to, to, to know that, that she, you know, where she is and, and, and you know, her state, you know, know about her well-being. Uh, and as I said, uh, we think it would be important that there's an investigation uh, into her allegations of sexual assault. Former doubles world number one Peng has not been seen or heard from publicly since she said on Chinese social media on November 2nd that former vice premier Zhang Gaoli coerced her into sex and they later had an on-off consensual relationship. Neither Zhang or the Chinese government have commented on her allegation. Peng's social media post was quickly deleted and the topic has been blocked from discussion on China's heavily censored internet. Concerns among the global tennis community and beyond has grown over Peng's safety. The Women's Tennis Association, or WTA, is calling for an investigation and said it was prepared to pull its tournaments worth tens of millions of dollars out of China over the issue. On Wednesday, WTA chief executive Steve Simon said he had received an email purporting to be from Peng and denying the allegations of sexual assault, but he cast doubt over the veracity of the email. A Chinese state media outlet also released the letter on Twitter. Hu Xijing, an influential Chinese state media editor, weighed in on the scandal on Twitter earlier on Friday, saying he does not believe Peng has been the target of retribution. Some of the world's top tennis players, including Naomi Osaka and Serena Williams, have tweeted hashtag where is Peng Shui. The hashtag has racked up over 32 million mentions on Facebook's Instagram and Twitter, according to website brand mentions. Both platforms are blocked in China. A former college professor was indicted for allegedly starting four wildfires in Northern California. The grand jury charged him for attempting to destroy federal property. We hear more from NTD's David Lamb. According to the Department of Justice, a federal grand jury on Thursday indicted Gary Stephen Maynard, a 47-year-old man who lives in San Jose. The former criminal justice professor was charged for an arson spree near the Shasta Trinity in Lassen National Forest in Northern California, setting fires behind firefighters battling the historic Dixie Fire earlier this year. Court documents indicate that Maynard is charged with setting the following fires between July and August. The Cascade Fire, Everett Fire, Ranch Fire, and the Conard Fire. The fires, prosecutors said, threatened to trap firefighters. Court papers say that Maynard has denied setting the fires. If convicted, he faces up to 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine for each count of arson. David Lam, NTD News, California. Beijing has achieved an unprecedented degree of control, especially in the Xinjiang region, over an ethnic group called Uyghurs. From cell phone numbers to DNA, the authorities have weaponized technology against the people. The spread of communist China's censorship and surveillance methods is sounding the alarm. The U.S. Congress held a hearing Wednesday to address the issue. In his opening remarks, Chairperson Senator Jeff Merkley described how China's communist regime uses technology in nefarious ways. These technologies offer the government an unprecedented degree of control, enabled by the collection of massive amounts of data from cell phones, from personal computers, DNA, security cameras, and more. The participants agreed George Orwell's 1984 is no longer science fiction, but today's China. They spoke about the many faces of communist China's techno-authoritarianism. The Great Firewall now prevents China's citizens from global engagement through one of the most extensive internet censorship systems the world has ever seen. China's northwest province of Xinjiang is home to 12 million people of an ethnic minority. Most are Uyghurs. 
Tragically, they are suffering under the CCP's tightening control. Our story today will focus on Xinjiang. Jeffrey Kane was an investigative journalist in China and the author of the book, The Perfect Police State. He interviewed 168 Uyghurs over three and a half years. And his book documents many human rights abuse cases. Kane's previous visit to Xinjiang's capital lasted only three days. Then he was detained and asked to leave. Since 2016, the People's Republic of China has engaged in an unprecedented experiment in social control in this region. It has deployed novel technologies in artificial intelligence, facial recognition, voice recognition, and biometric data collection to oppress its people in new and novel ways. Kane says many of his interviewees mentioned something in common. That is, many Chinese high-tech companies, including Huawei, are working on innovations that are later used to exert psychotorture on Chinese people. When refugees and former camp detainees say psychological torture, they mean the feeling of constantly being watched, not by humans, but by crude software algorithms designed to predict future crimes and acts of terrorism uh, with great inaccuracy. Kane told us his interviewees were so scared that they would be flagged as potential criminals under the CCP's surveillance that they seemed to develop their own system of self-monitoring. They train themselves to become like machines or robots, able to answer every question from the police in a pre-programmed way, repressing their own feelings, thoughts, and desires in the process. Some interviewees who had been detained said their fellow inmates in the Xinjiang concentration camp are suppressed to such an extent that they lack personalities and even expressions. They told Kane it was as if they had had a memory wipe. And Congressman Jim McGovern voiced concerns about forced labor in Xinjiang. He said audits in the region have been unreliable, making scrutiny on this issue dubious, and wondered if the surveillance is adding to the problem. Kane responded with a definitive yes. There is a serious uh, problem of extreme surveillance um, simply overpowering whatever audit function can exist within, um, you know, your typical multinational or American corporation that operates in the region of Xinjiang. The CCP wants total control. A BBC report in May said the CCP is even using AI to detect the state of people's emotions, and they are testing the technology on Uyghurs. And a California couple has allegedly gone on the run after being convicted of conspiring to swindle millions in COVID relief funds. The two have been on the run for three months now, and the FBI is offering a reward for information leading to their arrest. We hear more from NTD's David Lamb. A Southern California couple that swindled millions of dollars in COVID relief allegedly cut off their electronic bracelets and have gone missing, according to a Justice Department publication from Tuesday. Richard Ivazian and his wife, Marietta Terribilian, disappeared on August 29th. The Los Angeles couple conspired to obtain more than $20 million. The funds were meant for people and businesses impacted by COVID lockdowns. The two used the money to buy luxury homes and products. The FBI is offering up to $20,000 for information leading to their arrest. David Lamb, NTD News, California. A California Superior Court overturned a San Francisco school board ruling. The board previously said that a top-ranked high school could not use a merit system to admit students. We hear more from NTD's Dave Jason Blair. In California, the state Superior Court ruled on November 18th to nullify the San Francisco Board of Education's decision to remove Lowell High School's merit-based system. The court found on Thursday that the school board violated the Brown Act by not providing enough information about the meeting agenda. According to U.S. News, Lowell High is currently the top high school in the San Francisco School District and number 78 nationwide. The school board previously voted on February 9th to remove the merit-based admission system. The board cited systemic racism. However, three of the school board members who voted to remove the merit system are now facing a recall election next year. The mayor has backed the recall. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. The Austrian government announced that the whole country will go into full lockdown starting Monday. Officials made the decision as the country battles its fourth wave of infections. What's more, Austria is introducing a national vaccine mandate, the first in Europe. 
NTD's Kevin Hogan brings us more of the details and how some residents are reacting. Ten days. That's how long Austrian Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg said the country's virus lockdown will last, even for the vaccinated. Unless cases don't settle down, then it could be extended to 20 days. It's the latest effort to combat a recent outbreak with over 15,000 new infections reported in the country on Friday. It comes as a record high wave of infections hits Europe. On top of the lockdown, the Austrian leader announced everyone in the country must be vaccinated. Lange Zeit war es politischer Konsens, dass wir... For a long time, the political consensus was that we don't want a vaccine mandate in this country, but we have to look reality in the eye. For a long time, maybe too long, me and others thought that it must be possible to convince people in Austria, to convince them to get vaccinated voluntarily. The mandatory vaccination rule takes effect February 1st, and in the meantime, stores will close and cultural events are canceled. A doctor and former Austrian MP says no one can go to restaurants either. The theaters, cinemas uh, have to close down. Uh, all the haircutters, all, all the services, uh, cosmetics, uh, all, all these um, uh, shops have to close. Uh, the only thing uh, which is allowed is to go on the street for a stroll, to take a little bit of uh, air, to make some exercise outdoors, but it is forbidden uh, to have uh, gatherings more than 25 uh, people. The country's health minister says schools and kindergartens will stay open, but parents are encouraged to keep their children home. And as Austria becomes the first country in Europe to make vaccinations compulsory, some residents are making the comparison to authoritarian times within the Soviet bloc. And especially people who came uh, to Austria from the former uh, Eastern uh, communistic countries uh, like Slovakia, like Czech Republic, like Poland, we have a lot of doctors here from these countries and a lot of workers, and they all say uh, this is very similar uh, to the system uh, which they uh, fled from uh, before 1989, before the wall uh, in Berlin fell down. Though some Austrians agree with the lockdown, and they also say the vaccine is important to control the spread and allege the subsequent waves came because the vaccine was administered too late. Kevin Hogan. NTD News. The House this morning passed Biden's social welfare and climate spending package. And Biden and congressional Democrats doubled down, saying it's fully paid for. NTD's Melina Weiskup reports. After long hours on the House floor, this Build Back Better bill did pass the House nearly along party lines. And what held up the vote last night was House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy going on for a record-breaking a record-breaking speech, eight hours and 30 minutes, speaking about his disapproval of such a bill. Let's listen. You are spending so much money. Never before we spent less defeating Hitler, Mussolini, and Japan. What we have before us isn't a social spending bill. It's a pathway to socialism. Just one Democrat joined Republicans to oppose its passage, Representative Jared Golden from Maine. He says he's concerned about the trillions continuously being pumped into the economy and the plan benefiting the ultra wealthy more than average Americans. But all other Democrats cheered for the success. This bill is monumental. It's historic. It's transformative. It's bigger than anything we've ever done. Thank Pelosi you. says Biden called to congratulate them on getting it done. This bill comes right after Biden there signed the go. historic infrastructure bill. So if this makes it to Biden's desk, it will be around $3 trillion in investments in Biden's first year. And Vice President Harris is confident it will. And the president and I, I'll tell you, we are confident. And I just talked to him before I, before I came to Ohio. We are confident that the Senate will do the same. The Congressional Budget Office reports this bill adds more than $360 billion to the national deficit over the next 10 years. Some reports predict even more than that. But Democrats today double down on their messaging that this bill will be paid for through tax raises and other means. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. A lot of companies are tightening their vaccine policies, firing people who refuse to get the shot. But Bank of America is taking a different approach. An unnamed source working for the bank told the Epic Times that workers are being separated into two groups. 
He says unvaccinated workers in his Florida office are isolated on one floor and can't go anywhere else in the building. The source called the pilot program segregation. In a statement, Bank of America said that they don't mandate the vaccine and that they're taking steps to bring unvaccinated workers back into the office in a way that aligns with the CDC's guidelines. UK Home Secretary Priti Patel has announced an order to outlaw the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas in its entirety. It's a move that brings the UK's stance on Gaza's rulers in line with the US and the EU. Until now, Britain had banned only Hamas's military arm. The government now sees the distinction between the military and the political wings as artificial. Under the order, it will be illegal to be a member of Hamas or invite support for the group, such as by flying their flag or arranging meetings for them. Israel welcomed the UK's decision, while Hamas condemned the move. Founded in 1987, Hamas opposes the existence of Israel and peace talks, instead advocating armed resistance. Patel is expected to present the change to Parliament next week. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to catch all of our programs on TV. NTD Evening News is on every weekday at 6.30 p.m. Find your local NTD channel at ntd.com TV.